Thank you, Professor Shaheen, for this very nice introduction. And I'm, I'm you know, very honored to be uh, among you in Alexandria and to be uh, uh, sharing uh, and participating in this wonderful Congress. And thank you again for the invitation. So um, the topic for today would be um, searching for the Holy Grail, customized PRK and cross-linking combined. Is it a good idea or a big mistake? So I'm going to share with you my journey with it, and hopefully we're going to have a, a certain um, a guideline for it. So again, we have many options when we perform cross-linking. It is either cross-linking alone, or it is a cross-linking, then maybe later some customized PRK, typically in mild topographies, uh, as you can see here, or in very asymmetrical topography and advanced topographies, we might actually contemplate combined cross-linking with customized PRK. Now, there are many protocols of performing this, what is actually called CXL plus, or cross-linking with PRK. We are all familiar with the Athens protocol, introduced by John Canelopoulos more than 15 years ago. And at the time, it was using topography guided PRK with cross-linking, using a small optical zone of 5.5 millimeter, and advising treating up to 70% of sphere and cylinder with a maximum ablation depth of 50 microns. Mitomycin C.02% was used for 20 seconds at the time, and it was published in GRS. The results were pretty good. Um, we have the uh, Morpheus protocol introduced by Bruce Allen team using selective ocular uh, wavefront guided uh, PRK with cross-linking using large optical zone and mainly treating the higher order aberrations, uh, mu not much the lower order aberration, uh, with no mitomycin C um, usage. We had the uh, Sterex protocol by Miguel Rikiki and uh, Cosimo Mazota using topography guide and actually it's a corneal wavefront guided trans epithelial PRK with accelerated cross-linking with an optical zone that varied between six and seven millimeters, also treating primarily higher order aberrations, a maximum of 50 microns and also not using metamycin C. We have a PTK and cross-linking introduced by Kimionis, George Kimionis, called the Kratin protocol. Uh, using an epithelial PTK of uh, about 50 microns and cross-linking, no metamycin C use here. And finally, we have the customized PTK and cross-linking introduced by Rohit Chetty called TREK. Uh, it's a topography-guided PTK over the cone, just over the cone, and then epithelial debridement, and then cross-linking, maximum of 25 micron ablation, also no metamycin C. Now, um, what are the issues when we perform customized ablation um, special with cross-linking. One, we might have overcorrection. Two, biomechanical insult because we're removing stroma. Three, unpredictable uh, uh, stroma remodeling. And four, and most importantly, stromal haze. Now that's why it is important uh, to outsource our preoperative higher order aberration and our postoperative lower order aberration. And by outsourcing, I mean Think uh, outside the box, think of corneal ring segments or allogenic ring segments like CARES to debulk the cone before going to the really nitty gritty and try to treat a huge cone with a laser, trying to debulk it and leave the customized ablation to the very mild cone. Uh, again, nothing wrong with spectacle. We're doing therapeutic refractive surgery and not cosmetic surgery. And so we have to keep in mind that um, we should not go ahead and treat sphere and cylinder and ablate for the stroma further, we can actually outsource the, uh, those um, lower order aberrations to spectacles, uh, maybe also to uh, phacic lenses like in here, or there's no wrong to do a retreatment if we spare so much of the stroma. And as long as we are within a certain uh, low uh, stromal ablation. So what are the treatment modalities right now? The major treatment modalities are combined PRK and cross-linking versus sequential cross-linking and then later uh, PRK. And both can be done, but uh, the two are radically different. Well, the pros of combined treatment is that it's one procedure, so we don't have to get the patient to undergo two procedures with very slow recovery that can take up to six months to combine. It's a one year of almost um, uh, putting the patient in a dysfunctional state. A more optimal cross-linking because Bowman's layer is ablated, so the riboflavin penetrates deeper and hence we have more optimal cross-linking. And predictable tissue ablation because the, the tissue hasn't been tampered with 
uh, the stromal tissue ablation rate is known. The cons is that we have unpredictable biomechanical remodeling after cross-linking, and this actually will completely change our target um, uh, refraction. But that's why it's important not to target the refraction, but the higher order aberration. Um, we are assuming that cross-linking is successful a priori, but we're not sure whether cross-linking really has taken effect while it, we're ablating the stroma. So that's also another shortcoming. And finally, maybe, and question mark, more haze, and we're gonna see that in a minute. While sequential cross-linking then uh, PRK, well, one of the pros about it is that we are ensuring biomechanical stability before performing PRK. Two, uh, biomechanical changes are accounted for. When we revisit the cornea, we are sure that the cornea hasn't changed anymore. There are, we have two sequential measurements on topography that look stable, and then we go ahead and decide to further tweak that cornea by PRK. Question mark, less haze, um, uh, this is also debatable. The cons is that there are, these are two procedures with very slow recovery. And then uh, we are ablating the very same tissue we cross-linked. And bear in mind that the cross-linking is actually logarithmic. Most of the cross-linking tissue is in the upper 50 to 75 microns. And then we go down dramatically as we go deeper. And then we are going and ablating 30, 40 microns or maybe 50 microns of the very same tissue that we cross-linked. And finally, the tissue ablation rate has changed because once we cross-link, uh, the tissue response to the uh, laser pulses is different. And it's going to be not just an average because some patients cross-link much more than the other, as you notice sometimes with different development of haze. So this ablation rate, even though we might estimate it, it's not really purely an average. It might vary from patient to patient, and that will introduce um, uh, errors, not just in lower order aberration, but also in higher order aberrations. Now, if we look at combined crossing with PRK, um, which I've been doing for maybe uh, 15 years, I've had a major problem is that the haze. And that haze, as you can see here, can develop really nasty and can be kind of deep and can happen sometimes a year or a year and a half later for otherwise a patient who is 20, 20, extremely happy considering that you're your hero. And then suddenly, after a year and a year and a half, coming back, with gradual decrease in vision. And interestingly, this haze is associated with significant flattening to the fact that the cornea looks pretty nice, but the problem patients now has another problem, and that's corneal haze. And sometimes I call it reverse keratoconus, where actually the cornea starts to flatten and keep flattening years and years and years uh, uh, from, from the time of cross-linking, up to a point that we all know that we have a recycling of the collagen every seven, eight to 10 years, and then sometimes we have loss of stromal tissue, significant flattening, as you can see in here. And that's another patient right there. Now, if we look at the literature to kind of understand uh, what's going on, Canelopoulos published his first report com comparing both combined and sequential, and he didn't find much haze in both, but the haze was more significant with sequential than actual with combined but it was all using slit lamp. So slit lamp by a microscopy, we all know that the Fantis classification is kind of biased at best. And he used 20, 20 second mitomycin C in his report. Chan Kim Jonas did the same and kind of got similar results. Now, if we look at a report published by uh, Marconi Santiago as a senior author, we saw a completely different um, result. Well, we see significant haze developing up to a year and two years later. Uh, the haze was really hard and 23% had grade two, 4% had grade three. We have loss of best corrected visual acuity to a point they said that this procedure should never be done. What they used interestingly was mitomycin C for 40 seconds. And some patients actually they treated more than 50 microns as well. So the treatment was more, they used mitomycin C 40 seconds as opposed to Canelopoulos for 20 seconds. Canelopoulos revised his paper and reviewed his patients 10 years later, the very same patient, and he still insisted that the patients did very well 10 years later. It's the study by Bruce Allen using ocular wavefront guided uh, PRK they did not use any mitomycin C and found minimal to no haze, again, on slit lamp by microscopy. Miguel Rikiki also on slit lamp by microscopy, so again, a bit biased, found no minimal to no haze, also did not use any mitomycin C. 
So should we use myomycin C when performing combined PRK and cross-linking? And is it a source of problem at all? Now, we did a study published in GRS about two years, and it won the George Waring Medal Award by the GRS. Um, and we found that mitomycin C actually dramatically increases haze when combined with cross-linking. So what we did in that study, we did not do PRK. We just wanted to find out whether PRK and cross-linking have more haze, less haze, or no difference at all. And when we look at the haze, using artificial intelligence and a software that detects haze using AI completely unbiased, as opposed to all other studies, which actually use slit lamp, uh, we, we use OCT derived images and running a comma decoded uh, uh, algorithm, we found that uh, in blue, cross-linking with mitomycin C has had much more haze than cross-linking alone. Again, that's, um, that's the software detecting the, um, the corneal haze and it was published, the software is published in cornea and AJO as well. So, if we look again at the cornea, we can see that cross-linking kills the keratocyte all the way down to 300 microns, maybe more sometimes. It can't be that performing PRK alone will give us deep anterior haze and sometimes deep mid-stromal haze, and even, even deeper than that. I mean, PRK just is limited sub-epithelially. I would expect sub-epithelial haze, but not really deep haze. But what can cause deep haze is something called mitomycin C, which again has been shown to kill keratocyte all the way down to 300 microns and more, just like cross-linking, which kills keratocytes 300 microns. So these two agents kill keratocytes in a double whammy way all the way down to 300 microns and makes sense that when combining them, combining them at all, it produces a massive drop out of keratocytes, which will introduce a massive cytokine release. And that massive cytokine release can lead to significant haze. And then sometimes a lot of kerat keratocytes death will lead later to significant flattening because there's not much collagen that will renew that collagen available. And that's why we keep seeing this, those patients flattening more and more. First, we're very happy because keratocon is getting better. But then, you know, we're kind of shocked and appalled by what's happening. More and more patients getting flatter and flatter and flatter. So after that first study, we did a second study looking at now cross-linking with um, uh, custom PRK and no mitomycin C as opposed to crossing alone and looking at haze also using a artificial intelligence-based software. We also looked at cross-linking with um, PR, uh, cross-linking then PRK, but we don't have yet enough patients in this category, so it's a prospective study. That's why I'm a concentrate for these two groups, cross-linking alone and cross-linking with custom PRK without mitomycin C and looking at the corneal haze. Again, it's a prospective study. We did accelerated cross-linking um, with uh, uh, 10 milliwatt uh, per centimeter square, so nine, nine minutes at all. We looked at one, three, six, and 12 months. And last follow-up, it's, it's a constantly uh, uh, go ongoing study. And we um, look at OCT, it's every visit pre-op and every visit later. And when, uh, when we uh, got the images, we calculated them using the, I, the cloud. And again, using the same software, it's available now on OCT analysis, it's just a beta version. It's now on the property of neural vision and will be uh, soon available on Zeiss devices. So again, as you can see here, we're detecting the corneal haze. And if we look at the studies, we look at um, visual acuity, Logmar, of course, we see a, a better improvement in UDVA and CDVA in the trans-PRK group, plus cross-linking versus cross-linking alone. Now, if we look at uh, topographic results, the Kmax improves in cross-linking alone, but also in PRK with cross-linking. Corneal higher order aberrations, we see that um, uh, total higher order, total coma, spherical aberration, and total trefold improve at one year uh, post um, uh, PRK with cross-linking. Again, we did not, we did selective corneal wavefront aberrations. So basically, we, don't, we didn't treat higher, the lower order aberration, we did only the higher order aberration and what's embedded in it of lower order. That's why the mean ablation uh, depth over the cone was only 20 micron. And again, we looked at the haze reflectivity, at the anterior stromal reflectivity, at the sub-epithelial reflectivity. So the anterior haze, uh, reflectivity was pretty much similar between the two groups. The anterior stroma reflectivity was also similar between the two groups. 
Interestingly, the sub epithelial haze reflectivity was almost similar between the two groups, and we were kind of surprised because we thought that the sub epithelial haze would be a little bit more in PRK with crosslinking. But we thought also that ablating Bowman's layer would allow the riboflavin to go deeper instead of concentrating right under the epithelium, which means less haze sub epithelial, but the haze is distributed throughout, and this ultimately evened out, and the haze was almost the same. Mid cornea reflectivity was the same, and posterior stromal reflectivity was the same. So ultimately, both groups are the same, and we've debunked this, uh, um, uh, basically, the, this myth. Now, yes, we have one year minimum follow-up. We have about uh, a 19 month average follow-up. The, the longest follow-up is actually three years, so we're still waiting to have long-term results, uh, but at least for what it's happening now, now, it's pretty good. And I want to introduce a quick concept for what we did is the minimum ablation possible. I'm not encouraging anybody to go ahead and perform a minus three. We're, we're performing only custom PRK to regularize the cornea and not to treat refractive error because we will never be sure about the biomechanical changes in that cornea once we combine both. And two, we want to save precious thrombal tissue. But I want to introduce a concept that will allow you to regularize the cornea while minimizing tissue ablation. You don't have to go with a small optical zone in order to treat um, uh, very well the cornea. And that's what I call the uh, Athens paradox or the optical zone decoupling. So this is the, uh, a cone that we're going to treat. And as you can see here, if you look at uh, the treatment protocol, at least on the Schwinn Amaris here, this is the, the, the refraction of the patient. Now, of course, I'm not going to treat that refraction. And what I'm going to do, for instance, and this can be apl uh, applicable also on the outcome, but kind of a trial and error, I'm going to look at what, give, what gives me the lowest refraction possible. So in this protocol, I'm going to decide, tell the laser, all right, um, the remove all constraints and give me the treatment for higher order that will actually treat the lowest refraction possible. And in that case, as you can see here, it's minus 1.72, minus 2.27 at the same axis of astigmatism 153, which is pretty good. And by this, I'm shaving down from 77 to 37 micron. That's great. This refraction is embedded into my higher order aberration treatment. So if the patient, if the laser is gonna treat coma, it will change 2.27 diopter of astigmatism at 153. Because the coma, some of it has some cylinder embedded in it on refraction. That's perfect. Spherical aberration, it will show up under some uh, sphere. So this is embedded into my higher order aberration treatment. Perfect. If I go with that and I just say, okay, that's the refraction I want to treat, nothing more. Uh, that's the ablation I'm going to get to, right? Okay, I shaved the ablation by actually half. But more importantly, look at the optical zone here, 6.7. If I want to say, oh, well, the Athens protocol advocate for 5.5, I want to save tissue, let me go back to 5.5, right? And let's see how much ablation I'm going to get on the cone. It's still the same, if not actually more, 37. How is that possible? That's because I only treated the, spherical, the, the sphere and cylinder that are embedded into the uh, higher order aberration and not more. So, if I do that, as you notice, this is the spherical, uh, the spherical cylinder embedded. And if I want to ablate more, so go with larger optical zone, the laser will treat in breadth, but not in depth. So we'll have the same depth, but bigger optical zone. Now, if I want to be greedy and I say, well, I want to correct that patient. I'm going to go for minus four. Uh, sphere and minus 3.5 cylinder then because this is not embedded into my heart or other aberration It's going to respond to the Munnerlin's law So the Munnerlin's law of course says that the more I go with my optical zone That's going to be squared and then I have really large depth and this is where I'm going to have to go back to a smaller optical zone But that's gonna, not going to be great in order to improve my patients So again, if I look here, my aim is not really to flatten that cone only to regularize it. I have no problem if the cone is steep. That's just myopia. I can outsource it with spectacles, fake lenses, and what have you. So in that patient, look at that cone postoperatively with only 25 microns tissue ablated. Now it's a very central cone. And that patient starts from here to here. And he's 2020 minus. And actually, I did an, I an ICL for that patient. And he's super happy. Because of that, I outsource my aberration. And finally, what should we treat combined and what should we treat sequential? 
Again, let's keep in mind what Farhat Hafezi showed. We have an unpredictable biomechanical response after cross-linking. And that's why those cones, I will re treat with combined, but again, I will not treat the lower order aberration. I will only treat what's embedded, and I will treat the higher order. Now, this kind of cone, it's definitely sequential. I will cross-link first, see how he or she would do, and then later decide whether there is need to do any. Uh, PRK. And let's keep in mind when we do sequential and not combined of the difference in ablation rate, and it's about on the average 12% as showed by Farad Hafezi, 9% as showed by Theo Siler. So let's keep this uh, in mind. Thank you so much.